and uh, the stealth fighters, 117A, stuff like that. Uh, UFOs wasn't really uh, anything I was interested in, although I'd heard a few stories. And uh, as every pilot does, uh, well, they're always seeing some. I never saw anything uh, until uh, March 22nd of this year, which I'll tell you about. But my interest uh, you know, in UFOs came about uh, three and a half years ago. A friend of mine uh, who flew uh, in Laos with me, he was a raven. If any of you followed uh, those guys, they were people that were taken out of the Air Force, given civilian ID, and they flew directly for the U.S. ambassador in Laos uh, up on the uh, PDJ, the plane of jars. They did the forward air control for the U.S. airplanes that would come into the secret war in Laos. Anyway, Greg came in town about uh, three and a half, four years ago, and he was retiring. He came over to the house, and I hadn't seen him since very early 70s. We started talking, asked him where all he'd been uh, all these years, and uh, one of the bases that he said he'd flown at uh, was Bentwaters. Well, Bentwaters Air Force Base is a United States Air Force Base about 70 miles north of London. And supposedly in 19, or in, uh, on December 30th, 1980, a UFO landed there, and supposedly some, some aliens got out, and I'd heard the story. And when he mentioned Bentwaters, they said, oh, Bentwaters, that's supposedly where that UFO landed. He said, no, John, not supposedly, it did. He said, I didn't see it because I was confined to quarters, but I know the guys who did. And if you see them, just tell them we were, you know, we flew together in Laos, and they'll tell you what the scoop was. So he gave me the names of General Gordon Williams, uh, Major Ted Conrad, Colonel Chuck Hall, and a few others. And I looked at Greg and I said, what do you mean all this stuff is real? There really are UFOs and aliens and all that? And he said, well, I don't know about the aliens. He said, but the UFOs are real. So I got to thinking, boy, here's something I've been missing. He said, and uh, out of my airline indication and everything, I better, I better find out what's going on. So I set out on a search. Uh, it took about three and a half, four years uh, to find out uh, what was going on. And I uh, dipped down into my um, reserve of intelligence contacts. Uh, I made a lot of trips around the United States, made a lot of phone calls. Got my truck uh, one month, spent a month going out, driving around Arizona, Colorado, and New Mexico, talking to people who would not talk on the phone, but who would uh, talk to me face to face. And these included Army, uh, Navy. Incidentally, Navy's got the, the control of this entire cover up. Everybody is thinking it's the Air Force, you know, and they're always right to the Air Force this and the Air Force that. They don't have anything to do with it, it's the Navy. And I talked to uh, various DIA, CIA people, and when I got back in December 1987, I wrote what became known as the John Lear Hypothesis, and which since has been proven to be uh, absolutely, totally right on the mark, true, except for various dates, maybe uh, one or two months off. Uh, but it, it's checked out thoroughly, and I'll tell you how. Now, one of, the, one of the people I ran into was a guy named Larry Warren, and Larry Warren was a, the, uh, at Bentwaters. He was with security police, and he was uh, a foreign part of the perimeter guard that surrounded this UFO when it landed. Okay. Larry was uh, part of this uh, perimeter guard that surrounded the UFO. And uh, Larry was in town uh, the other day. Uh, in 1985, CNN did a 30-minute uh, special on the Bentwaters incident. And uh, what I'd like to show you here is the most comprehensive cover-up in the history of mankind. It's why most people think of flying saucers as a joke. This nation has been systematically and thoroughly brainwashed into believing that flying saucers do not exist. We have been conditioned to think of extraterrestrials in terms of the distance is great, the time to travel on the the speed of light, the serious news media leans over backwards to avoid the main way except the season. TV and tabloids operate a censorship in reverse by exaggerating, sensationalizing the facts 
face history. They reduce them to absurdity. Ridicule. Ridicule is defined as words or actions intended to invoke contemptuous laughter at a person or a thing. Fear of ridicule is the primary emotion on which the government's cover-up of UFO was based. But let me tell you something. Our survival, yours and mine, depend on our ability to recognize that we have been beaten by a well-meaning but inept military and government into believing that there is no threat and that flying saucers do not exist. For those who believe they exist and entertain the simplistic belief that they are all our benevolent space brothers here to guide us into a battle-free utopian society fails to correlate with the known facts of numerous case histories. Here's what one Navy captain involved in the cover-up said to Ray Stanford, eminent UFO researcher, after he caught Stanford with a piece of an extraterrestrial grass, which incidentally came from the Socorro incident. He says, you have no right to that dynamite. What do you want to do? Blow up the whole economy, the entire social structure, and every other institution worth keeping? Those in a position to know are under no delusion. They know the facts. People are not ready to know the facts and they have no need to know the facts. They could, half of them, half the people maybe go off the deep end. So Stanford asked the captain if those in the know had cracked up after learning the facts. I doubt it, he was told, but those men are trained to meet and accept crises. They are capable of rational judgment in the face of the unexpected. Their decisions are based on experience in considering the welfare of larger groups of people. That provides experience and discernment that the average man, not even the UFO researcher, ever has. Well, isn't that special? Giordano Bruno got burned at the stake in the year 1600 for daring to say that the sun does not revolve around the earth. Even though he was correct, people did not want to hear it. The church did not want to hear it. And the fact that the earth revolves around the sun was successfully suppressed for another 200 years. It eventually caused a major upheaval in the church, government, and thought, a realignment of social and traditional values. Today, I'm telling you that a small group of military and civilian thugs, usurping the constitutional authority of the Senate and the Congress, entered into an illegal agreement with an alien nation in which, under the cover of national security, human lives were traded for highly advanced technology. The enormous cause involved in this cover-up and production of the technology was financed by the importation of massive amounts of drugs from Southeast Asia. Fortunately for my efforts to get the truth out, all I'm getting is a little ridicule. But let me tell you my story, and you can make up your own mind whether or not it's true. In its effort to protect our democracy, our secret government made a deal with this alien nation. But we were double-crossed, and the government believes that it's vitally important that you don't find anything about it until they can get things under control. But the situation now is so far out of hand at this point that there is very little chance of that. And I believe that you have the right to know the truth. It's your right as an American. It's your right as a human being. What I'm going to tell you now is true beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's not important that you believe it now. Just listen and follow it away. The next few months, maybe even years, you'll wake up one fine day and say to yourself, my gosh, the son of a gun was right. Of course, by then it'll be too late. So listen up. Number one, the United States government since July 7, 1947 has collected and has in its possession at least 15, but probably closer to 25 extraterrestrial flying saucers belonging to at least three different alien civilizations from far beyond our solar system. At least five are undamaged, and the Air Force has flown these under a secret program known as Project Red Light, uh, which is continuing to this date at the Nevada test site, and I'll show you exactly where in a few minutes. Number two, the United States government has in cryogenic storage at least 30, but maybe closer to 100 alien bodies representing as many as three different civilizations from far beyond our solar system. The bodies were or are kept at Wright-Patterson and Homestead Air Force bases, and there is an alien corpse display at the CIA facility in Langley, Virginia. 
At least three of the aliens were captured alive, and one is still living up at Groom Lake, Nevada, and I'll show you exactly where. Number three, at least one million Americans and probably far more have been abducted since the early 1940s. These abductions last about two hours and are carried out for three purposes. The first purpose is to insert a tiny transmitter the size of a BB, or in some cases much smaller, into the brain of the subject in order to cert monitor certain biological functions, the specifics of which we are unknown to us at this time. The transmitters are implanted into human beings first at the age of four or five. They are picked up again and checked that out at the age of 10 or 12, and at about the age of 18, the implant is sometimes removed. The second purpose of the abduction is to program the individual through post-hypnotic suggestion. On the basis of some of these cases, we believe that some sort of an enormously important event may occur within the next one to four years. And the abductees have been post-hypnotically programmed to proceed to a certain place and perform a certain function during that event. In some cases, the abductees have been shown what appears to be similar to a TV channel changer and advised that at the proper time, they'll remember what the unit was for and how to work it. Under our best hypnotic techniques, we are enabled to find out when or what. The third reason for the abductions is interbreeding, experiments where you've been crossbed with uh, the aliens. In his book, Intruders, Bud Hopkins tells us about his two and a half year investigation of Kathy Davis of Indianapolis, who was inseminated by aliens and produced seven crossbreeds. Number four. During the past 13 years, over 14,000 cattle throughout the U.S., Canada, and South America have been mutilated in a completely grotesque manner. The mutilations have been investigated by many state and federal agencies, including the FBI, and was the subject of the Emmy Award-winning production, A Strange Harvest, produced by Linda Moulton Howe for the CBS affiliate in Denver. The government issued several press releases blaming the mutilations on predatory animals. However, it was proven that the mutilations were performed using advanced laser surgical equipment which actually cut between the cells of the tissue, a process presently beyond our technology. The animal's, gen the animal's genitals, rectum, reproductive organ, and eyes were, re were removed in most cases while it was still alive. One in interesting phenomenon in nearly all the mutilations is that no blood was found in or near the carcasses and that there was no vascular collapse of the remains. The mutilations have occurred as far north as Canada, where mutilations are classified top secret by the government, and as far south as Brazil. Mutilations have occurred this year, over 200 this year have occurred in a large East Coast city. Number five, it is unknown exactly which one of the 70 or more alien civilizations which are visiting us at this time are responsible for the mutilations. However, there is private scientific speculation that these parts and their glandular secretions are used for food and or genetic experiments. Now I'd like to show you an excerpt from uh, Linda Howe's Strange Harvest. Disease, lightning strikes, predator attacks, and other natural causes. But in northeastern Colorado, another favorite spot for the mutilators, Tex Graves, former sheriff of Logan County, insists the 93 mutilated carcasses he investigated were not natural deaths. Uh, the very first one we had was southwest of Sterling. Uh, when we first looked at it, it was just unbelievable uh, that you could take an animal and do this too without uh, leaving some kind of track, some kind of evidence behind, such as uh, cigarette butts, matches, handprints, footprints, but there was nothing. Uh, the animal looked almost horrible, and it was something that uh, I didn't really want to believe then. And there was, uh, we probably had, had five or six others before I really did believe something strange was going on. We had one up north where we believe the animal was paralyzed and was alive when it was being mutilated. An eye and an ear, the uh, tongue, the rectal area was taken out, but the animal dug a hole with its head, but none of the other parts of the body moved, not even the legs. What force could hold? In 76 north of town, 
on a very hard pasture, almost like hard brick. We found tripod marks 12 inches across. Now, the tripod marks were 14 feet apart. We found one set that had gone in the ground roughly eight inches. And it would take a good post hole digger or, or shovel to dig in like this. It indicated something very heavy had set down in this area, yet there was no tracks leading from it nor to it. Almost nightly when this was going on, uh, we could pick out a very brilliant, huge, brilliant light in the sky. And we had a newsman take pictures of it with a very high-powered lens, but all we got out of this was the movement of it and the light showing very brilliant. Several times we observed enough smaller lights come out of this aircraft and then come down toward Earth. This huge, brilliant light would hang in the air, and then when it would move, it could move up and down, backwards, forwards, travel very rapidly. And after a while, these smaller lights would join up with the larger one, and then they'd disappear. So is the chief investigator for the district attorney's office in Trinidad, Colorado. It's not difficult to tell a predator kill. I mean, uh, a coyote or a bobcat or a lion, of course, will grab and tear. Uh, it wasn't that way uh, with any of the mutilations I covered, and the first two were amazing. The others had been completely removed with a very clean, apparently a surgical cut. Cows were laying. They were underneath some tall oak. We checked the upper branches just in case we had heard of the mutilations in other parts of the country, or the uh, possibility of the bee animals being dropped, removed from where they were killed and dropped in the area where they were being found. If extraterrestrials are the ones mutilating animals, what do you think the implications are then for this planet? Throughout the mutilations, all of us involved have been concerned with the possibility of the mutilations going from animals to human beings, understandable. Thank God to this point it hasn't happened. Uh, whatever they're doing with the portions of these animals they are taking, I haven't the slightest idea. There's a reason for it. It's not haphazard. There's a pattern to it. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think it's a, uh, a wait-and-see game. What else can we do? If we do have beings from outer space doing this, with the capabilities to do things like this, uh, what can we as a human race do? If they uh, have the knowledge and the technology that it looks like they have, uh, we're powerless. So. Maybe uh, it's a wait-and-see game. I can't see anything else to do. If a secret probe was being conducted either by our own intelligence agencies or by UFO entities, then they shouldn't be leaving a mass of carcasses all over the states because this only... Drawn in 1971, this is a case of the right hand not knowing what the left hand was doing. Uh, it was edited by Major Donald G. Carpenter and Colonel Edward B. Thurkelson. Chapter 13, titled, Unidentified Flying Objects. According to this, the UFO phenomenon has been around about 50,000 years. Chapter 13 of Introductory Space Science brings the Air Force Academy students through about 50,000 years of UFO history. From the 47,000-year-old granite carvings in the Hunan province to the Tassili Plateau rock sculptures of 6,000 B.C. to the story of Ezekiel in 593 B.C. to the Irish accounts in 956 A.D. up through 1742 and the UFO over London in that year to 1897 when the first cattle mutilations occurred on the Hamilton Ranch in Leroy, Kansas to 1947 and the Ken Arnold sightings to the Lani Zamora incident in Socorro, New Mexico, on April 24, 1964, a police officer witnessed two humanoids dressed in silvery coveralls jump in a cylindrical type object and fly away. The chapter covers the Betty and Barney Hill abduction of September 19th and, uh, 1961, which became the first widely known abduction case. The Betty and Barney Hill case was particularly fascinating because under separate in highly controlled conditions, each was hypnotized separately for several months with a post-hypnotic suggestion that they would not remember or discuss between themselves what was discovered. 
At the conclusion, their stories matched perfectly. One very peculiar incident related uh, by Betty was the fact that at one point the alien stuck a needle into her stomach. She asked him why, and they said, it's a pregnancy test. She told him, well, that was no pregnancy test here on Earth. And that was in 1961. It was to be a prophetic account because amniocentesis was developed in the early 1970s. And this was a method to surgically withdraw the fluid from the uterus of the pregnant female for use in determination of sex uh, or genetic disorders in the fetus. This was eight years after her abduction. On page 461 of the Academy of Physics book, this surprising statement is made. The most commonly described alien is about three and a half feet tall, has a round head, arms reaching to or below his knees, and is wearing a silvery space suit or coveralls. Other aliens appear to be essentially the same as Earthmen, while still others have particularly wide wraparound eyes or mouths with very thin lips. There is a rare group, reporters about four feet tall, weight of around 35 pounds and covered with thick hair or fur. Members of this last group are described as being extremely strong. Now I'd like to show you something similar to this. This comes from the Stringfield documents. Here's a picture of what is known as uh, the gray. We've all seen this. Up at the test site, their nicknames are the gourds. Uh, they call them the gourds because of the shape of their heads. Uh, at least that's what the guards call them. Uh, they probably come from a star system known to us as Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2, about 37 year, light years away from us. Uh, as you can see, the relative portions are of, of a, a five-month fetus. These drawings were made uh, with the help of a CIA informant and a surgeon who performed an autopsy of a gray in the late 40s. Here's a detail of the head. There is a large brow. The eyes are quite large, brown in color with no eyelids. Here's a detail uh, of the hand. It has four fingers which are slightly webbed with no opposable thumb. And the following items were noted by an autopsy, uh, during an autopsy by an army surgeon at Walter Reed in the late 40s. About three and a half to four feet tall, weight of about 40 pounds. Two almond-shaped eyes without pupils, no earlobes. Mouth small appears not to function as a means of communication or means of food ingestion. Arms extending to the knees. Skin blue or gray, no teeth, no apparent reproductive organs, colorless liquid prevalent in the body without red cells, no digestive tract. The available evidence indicates that we have a wide variety of visitors, about 70 different species in fact, with various different types of motivation for being here and different ways of interacting with us. Some have had us under surveillance since deep and took antiquity periodically stimulating our developments. Since 19,000 sightings of enormous craft swooping low over the Hudson Valley in New York, in October and November of 1987, there were hundreds of recorded sightings of craft larger than the 747 flying slowly over Whitfield, Virginia, reported variously as huge triangles or disc-shaped objects. In the past year, human and animal mutilations continue unabated in New York, Nevada, and the Midwest. Abductions are continuing nationwide. The Foreman Arkansas sightings of huge objects have started again. The Oklahoma sightings of February 1st, 1989 were a dazzling array of unidentified flying objects seen by more than dozens. Then there were the sightings in, in Key Largo, January 12th, and continued sightings in Illinois, Wisconsin, was Kansas, Washington, Alabama, Pennsylvania, and nightly sightings in Central America, particularly Guatemala City. On March 4th, 1980, 88, the ABC affiliate in Pensacola, Florida, presented a 30-minute documentary showing 36 clear photos and a minute and 38 seconds of an extraterrestrial craft, and these sightings are still continuing. Let me show you. They proudly thought of themselves the most powerful nation on Earth, having recently produced the atomic bomb, bomb in one world war. They had built jet aircraft that uh, would exceed the speed of sound in a few months. They had built bombers with intercontinental range that could carry weapons of enormous destruction. The post-war era had brought economic prosperity and the future seemed bright. Now just imagine what it was like for those same leaders 
all of whom had witnessed the panic of the Orson Welles broadcast of the War of the Worlds in 1938, just seven or nine years earlier. Thousands of Americans had panicked at a realistically presented invasion of Earth by beings from another planet. Imagine their horror as they actually viewed the dead bodies of the real aliens, frightening little creatures with enormous eyes, reptilian skin, and claws at the end of their fingers. Imagine their shock as they attempted to determine how the strange saucers were powered and could discover no part even remotely similar to components they were familiar with. No cylinders, no pistons, no vacuum tubes, no turbines, no hydraulic actuators. It's only when you fully understand the overwhelming helplessness the government was faced with in the summer of 1947 can you comprehend their perceived for a total their perceived need for a total thorough and sweeping cover-up to include the use of deadly force this enormous cover-up was initiated initiated on september 24 1947 by president truman by an executive order which established a group of 12 top military scientific and intelligence personnel of their time they were known as the mj-12 Although the group exists today, none of the original members are still alive. Uh, Gordon Gray was the last member to pass away, as the original member. As each member passed away, another was appointed to fill the position. The group today is composed of more members than the original 12, and among those who are thought to be current members are Dr. Kissinger, Dr. Ed Teller, General Lou Allen, uh, head of uh, space technology, and Admiral Bobby Inman. On November 18, 1952, President-elect Eisenhower was briefed on Majestic 12 and the cover-up by Admiral Roscoe H. Hillencotter. Hillencotter was MJ-1 and had been the director of Central Intelligence Agency from May of 47 to September of 50. Sometime during the latter part of 1953 or the early part of 54, President Eisenhower was rushed from a vacation in Palm Springs to Muroc Dry Lake, which is now called Edwards Air Force Base, and witnessed a flying saucer. According to some sources, Eisenhower told the aliens that the world was not ready for them, and that's where the matter rested for about 10 years. Incidentally, one of our well-known astronauts witnessed that saucer landing at Muroc Dry, Muroc Dry Lake. Project Blue Book made 14 reports before it was terminated by the Air Force in 1969 after reviewing the Condon Report. The public got to see 13 of the re reports, number 1 through 12, and number 14. Project Blue Book Report number 13 consisted of 624 pages typed offset, reproduced on white paper with a gray cover. It covered U.S. government official UFO procedures, classifications, and all top secret UFO activity from 1942 through 1951, addendum to 1963. Last year, I met with a former information analyst with the Air Force Electronic Security Services who saw an actual copy of the, of the Project Grudge Blue Book Report number 13. This man's name is Bill English and will be speaking with us today. I also talked with Bill Cooper, formerly of Naval Intelligence Briefing Team, who also saw the Grudge 13 report. I also talked with a government scientist who also saw a copy of the report. Here are some of the things that they remembered as being in the document. Chapter 1, UFO Activity. Significant UFO sightings, UFO landings, UFO alien close approaches, abductions, detention, crashed UFOs, UFO retrievals, sensitive military and industrial areas where close encounters occurred, technical details on dismantled UFOs, UFO physics, exotic nuclear and weaponry, clean breeder reactor the size of a football, ultrasonic light ray and beam weapons. Chapter two was the photographic section included all glossy pages, photos either three and a half by five or eight by 10. Photos of sensitive UFOs, color photographs of uh, crashed UFOs, three in con good condition, one dismantled. Color, folks, uh, color photographs of uh, deceased aliens, average four and a half feet tall, color photographs of three live aliens, color photographs of human mutilations, including head, rectum, sex organs, internal organs, blood removal, etc. Chapter three was human and humanoid aliens, humanoid species, humanoid autopsies, no indication of age, small species similar to human varied in height a few inches, liquid chlorophyll based nourishment. At this time they were aware of 17 different species. 
Food absorbed through the mouth membrane, waste excreted through the skin, language similar in appearance to Sanskrit, used mathematical phrases. Live alien communicated only desired answers to questions, remained silent on undesired questions. In the early 1950s, according to Project Blue, Report, uh, Blue Book Report number 13, people who had close encounters the third and relocated to one of four relocation centers encounter experienced. These sites were located in the Midwest and the Northwest U.S. with one site on the Utah-Nevada border. These relocation centers had extensive medical facilities available to deal with all medical emergencies, including radiation poisoning, psych psychotherapy, and deprogramming. One example of uh, this is the Darlington Farm case of Ohio in 1953. As they sat there eating dinner, the lights in the farmhouse began to dim. Outside, the dogs and other animals began to raise a ruckus. The 13-year-old boy gets up from the dinner table, see what's going on. He calls to his mother and father to come outside and see a funny light. The mother and father went out on the porch. As they got to the porch, one of the dogs broke loose and ran into an open field in front of the house. The boy began chasing it as the light came down and began to hover, over in, uh, hover in the open field. As the mother and father watched, the boy started screaming for help. The father grabbed his shotgun and ran into the field, only to witness his son being dragged away by little humanoids into the, fire, into the fiery, large-looking object. The father fired several rounds into the object, but to no avail, and it took off. They found the dog with its head crushed, but no sign of the, bo of the boy or any other footprints. The father immediately called Darlington police, and they came out to investigate. Their official report read that the boy had run off and was lost in the forest which Bubba bordered the farm. Within 48 hours, the Air Force made the determination that the family was to be relocated, and the mother and father were picked up by Air Force intelligence, and all personal belongings and possessions were loaded into Air Force trucks and moved to a northwestern relocation site. The mother was in shock and had to go through a great deal of psych psychotherapy and deprogramming, as did the father. On April 25th, 1964, the first official communication, communication between the aliens and our U.S. government took place at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. Three saucers came in, one landed at a prearranged area, and a meeting was held between the aliens and intelligence officers of the U.S. government. The whole sequence was filmed by five motion picture cameras. An acquaintance of mine in uh, Los Angeles, Bob Emenager, was given 800 feet of this film in 1973 to view when he was asked to prepare a documentary when it was decided to originally release the truth about flying saucers to the public. This was in the beginning of 1973. Unfortunately, when Watergate developed, it was decided the public could not handle two traumatic developments at the same time, and the document was changed. The document, which you can still get today, but I don't know where, started and it gave you the whole history of UFOs up into the very end, and the, the very the crowning thing for this documentary, which was narrated by Rod Serling, was they were going to show this uh, landing at Hollum in the actual film. But what happened is that because of uh, Watergate, they decided that uh, they were not going to release the true information to the public, and the end they changed and they put in drawings, and the drawings at the end simulate. And Rod Serling, I'll show you this just this one cut from uh, uh, UFOs that has begun. And Rod says, um, let's consider an incident that may happen in the future or could have already happened in the past. Well, of course, it already did happen in the past, but they weren't going to tell the public. And one of the interesting things about this is if you look very closely, and I'll try and point it out, there is a seven-second segment right after the, after the beginning, and I'll show you where it is, that's part of the real film. And I was over in uh, Frankfurt about oh, almost a year ago with Emmenager, and uh, we were in the bar talking about the film, and I said, you know, how did you guys fake that uh, saucer shot, that one coming over the hill where the camera zooms in? I said, it's awful hard to tell. I said, boy, it kind of looks like it might be part of the real film to me. And he said, yeah, it is part of the real film. And uh, he said, I said, well, I said, let me guess. You left it in there because, one, the, the public wouldn't believe it. And number two, would it cost too much money to fake it? He said, yeah. The number, he said, that's exactly right. The public would not believe it. It's too short a segment. You can't really tell. And it saved us a lot of money trying to fake it. So I'll point out that seventh segment, and that is part of the real shot coming in.
contact will be made. Let's look at an incident that might happen in the future, or perhaps could have happened already. The premise is that contact is made by extraterrestrial beings with representatives of the United States Air Force at Holloman Air Force Base in the deserts of New Mexico. The day is clear. It's about 5.32 a.m. at Holloman Air Force Base. Traffic light. One recon plane is on the field ready for takeoff when Sergeant Mann is given a report of an approaching unidentified craft. Yeah, Bill, uh, no, nothing on the line. I'll repeat it again. Uh, unidentified approaching objects on Portland 49er, 34 degrees southwest, fallen right to the right. Of course, uh, probably a stray civilian, maybe. Uh, keep me in court. I see him over there. Check with Edwards. Make contact with him, Bill. Uh, this is Holloman Air Force Base Control Tower. Identify yourself. What's your tail number? You're encroaching on military airspace. Warning, identify yourself. You're in a restricted military air corridor. Call the base commander. Base commander's office, Sergeant Wentmore speaking. Yes? Yes, hold on. This is Colonel Horner, yes? Yes, an unidentified vehicle. You warned the aircraft again? One, four, two, turn What's it? Zero, four, shape? Zero, radar, Check Edwards. Civilian patrol. Okay, all right. Uh, down to red alert. Unidentified aircraft approaching. Hey, Bill, give me a quick check with Wright-Patterson Intelligence. There may be an experimental craft from somewhere. I don't know here. Alert the fire chief and security and safety. to escort the unidentified crafts out of the area. During a routine photographic mission, a tech sergeant and staff sergeant of the base photographic team were aboard a helicopter at the time and run off several feet of film of the three objects, one of which breaks away and begins a descent. A second high-speed camera crew on the ground runs off approximately 600 feet. The cameras continue to roll as the extraordinary vehicle comes into view. It hovers almost silently about 10 feet off the ground for nearly a minute and yaws like a ship at anchor, then sets down on three extension pads. The commander and two officers, along with two base Air Force scientists, arrive and wait apprehensively. A panel slides open on the side of the craft, stepping forward, one, then two, and a third, what appear to be men dressed in tight-fitting jumpsuits, perhaps short by our standards, with an odd blue-gray complexion, eyes set far apart, a large pronounced nose. They wear a headpiece that resembles a rope-like design. The commander and the two scientists step forward to greet the visitors. Arrangements are made by some sort of communication, and the group quickly retires to an inner office in the King One area. Left behind stand a stunned group of military personnel. Who the visitors are, where they're from, and what they want is unknown. We now have a new challenge, perhaps the most monumental in recorded history. The opportunity to investigate a phenomenon that could change our destiny. Through the study and understanding of the UFO phenomena, we may discover a new energy force, or how to use it, or it could lead to an understanding of our relationship to life throughout the universe. And if there are beings from distant advanced societies, we may be privileged to see a revelation a look at ourselves a thousand years in the future. And perhaps at this very moment, located in another galaxy, somewhere in infinite space, other beings raise similar questions and discuss the possibilities of life outside their planet and talk about Earth as part of their plans for the near future. Colonel was the head of audio visual at Norton Air Force Base, and he actually saw the film run through. Uh, Robert Emmenager saw blow-ups from the original frames uh, of the uh, film. 
In the late 1960s and possibly earlier, MJ-12, representing the U.S. government, made a deal with these creatures called EBEs. The deal was that in exchange for super advanced weapon technology that the aliens would provide to us, we agreed to ignore the abductions that were going on, and further, we would help suppress the information on the cattle mutilations. The EBEs assured MJ-12 that these abductions, usually lasting about two hours, were merely the ongoing monitoring of a developing civilization. In fact, the abductions for a, were for a much more sinister reason. The U.S. government was not initially aware of the far-reaching con consequences of their deal. They were led to believe that the abductions were essentially benign, and since they figured they would probably go on anyway, they agreed and merely in insisted that a list of current abductees be submitted to MJ-12. Does this sound incredible? Unbelievable? Those responsible for this disaster hope and pray you will dismiss it as so much rubbish. But it's getting harder and harder for Americans to buy this cover-up. There has not been one, not one official statement from the government on flying saucers since 1969 when the Connor report said that they didn't exist and when the Air Force closed Project Blue Book. Not one government official has uttered a word about flying saucers except President Reagan. What did President Reagan say? Well, in the last two years of his presidency, he made four references to a threat by invaders from outer space. The first one was on December 4th, 1985. You can write, get a copy of this uh, statement. Remarks of the president to the Falston High School students and faculty, wherein he says, I couldn't but one point in our discussions privately with General Secretary Gorbachev, when you stop to think that there were all God's children wherever we may live in this world, I couldn't help but say to him, just think how easy his task and mine might be in these meetings that we held if suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet outside in the universe. We'd forget all our little local differences that we have between our countries, and we would find out once and for all that we are, that we are really all human beings here on this earth together. Then, September 21st, 1987, text of remarks by the President to the 42nd General Assembly of the United Nations. He said, in our obsession with the antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bond. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? What could be more alien to our universal aspirations of our people than the war, threat of war? And in Chicago, June 1988, President Reagan compared the danger of nuclear weapons with a hypothetical situation in which the world was threatened by a power from outer space. Now, wait a minute, you say. Why haven't I heard about any all this? How come nobody is talking? Well, because reporters don't want to dig. They're afraid of ridicule. They're afraid people will laugh at them. They think it's smart or in to ridicule UFO researchers. Yes, if you ask them why aliens couldn't be here right now on Earth, they say, well, because somebody would know. But I'll tell you the real reason. It's because it's a secret. It's the biggest damn secret in the history of mankind. Now I want you to hear of what some very credible people have had to say over the, for, uh, about flying saucers over the years. Here's Vice Admiral Hillen Cotter. It is time for the truth to be brought out. Behind the scenes, some high-ranking Air Force officials are soberly concerned about UFOs. But through official secrecy and ridicule, many citizens are led to believe the unknown uh, flying objects are nonsense. Here's President Carter. If I become president, I'll make every piece of information this country has about UFO sightings available to the public and the scientists. I am convinced that UFOs exist because I have seen one. What did Carter do for us? Here's what Major Gordon Cooper had to say. Several days in a row, we sighted groups of metallic saucer-shaped vehicles at great altitudes over the base. This was in Germany in 1951. And we tried to get close to them, but they were able to change direction faster than our fighters. I do believe UFOs exist, and that the truly unexplained ones are from some other technologically advanced civilization. Here's what General Nathan Twining had to say. The phenomenon reported is something real and not visionary or fictitious. Here's what um, 
Oh, here's our old friend, Dr. Carl Sagan. He was drawn into MJ-12 in about 1963 because of statements like this. In 1962, he told the American Rocket Society Convention, we must be prepared to face the probability that we have been visited by intelligent beings from outer space and the likelihood that as a requisite to those visits, they would have used bases on the averted side of the moon. Old Dr. Wilbur Smith in Canada said flying saucers exist. The matter is the most highly classified subject in the United States, rating even higher than the H-bomb. And one last quote from an old friend of ours, General Douglas MacArthur. In 1955, here's what he told the New York Times. Now remember, this is General Douglas Ma MacArthur talking. The nations of the world will have to unite, for the next war will be an interplanetary war. The nations of Earth must someday make a common front against an attack by people from other planets. MacArthur said that in the New York Times. Now, seven years later, to the graduating class at West Point, here's what else MacArthur said. We deal now not with things of this world alone, but with unimaginable distances and as yet unfathomed mysteries of the universe. We are reaching out for a new and boundless frontier. We speak in terms of harnessing the cosmic energy of ultimate conflict between a united human race and the sinister forces of some other planetary galaxy. During the period of 1979 to 1983, it became increasingly obvious to MJ-12 that things were not going as planned. It became known that uh, thousands more than the people listed on their list uh, were being abducted. Some of our top scientists had been, who had objected to this uh, going on, and 50 of them were massacred uh, in the summer of 1980. MJ-12, uh, by 1984, MJ-12 must have been a stark terror at the mistake they had made in dealing with the EBEs. They had subtly promoted close encounters of the third kind, and ET, to get the public used to these small, odd-looking creatures that were com compassionate, benevolent, and very much our space brothers. MJ-12 sold the EBEs to the public and were now faced with the fact that quite the opposite was true. In addition, a plan had been formulated in 1968 to make the public aware of the existence of aliens on Earth over the next 15 years to be culminated with several documentaries to be released in the 1983-1985 period of time. These documentaries would explain the history and intentions of the EBEs, and the discovery of the grand deception put the entire plans, hopes, and dreams of MJ-12 into utter confusion and panic. Meeting at the country club, a remote lodge and private golf course, comfortable sleeping quarters and working quarters in its own private airstrip, built exclusively by and for the members of MJ-12, it was a factional fight of what to do now. Part of MJ-12, which had become now military heavy, wanted to confess the whole scheme and, and shambles it had become uh, uh, to the American public, beg their forgiveness, and ask for their support. But the majority of MJ-12 argued that there was no way they could do that. The situation was basically untenable, and there was no use in exciting the public with a horrible truth. The best plan was to continue the development of a weapon that could be used against the EBEs. Unfortunately, towards the end of last year, 1987, whatever that weapon was uh, to contain the EBEs failed. A new program has been suggested, but it's going to take about two years to put in place. In the meantime, it's essential for MJ-12 that nobody finds out what happened uh, or is going on and the use of deadly force is authorized. Now you say to me, John Lear, this is all very interesting and extremely entertaining, but it just can't be true. It can't be true for one simple reason. The government never has, nor will they ever be able to keep a secret. And I will say this to you, if you truly believe that this government cannot keep a secret when it wants, then I have some swampland in Florida I need to talk to you about right after this meeting. But you say, John, surely somebody would have talked. One of the astronauts who saw the strange objects on the moon, or one of them who saw the huge piece of mining equipment on the backside of the moon on Apollo 8. Yep, a few of them tried to talk, but they were silenced, most notably uh, Gordon Cooper. They are silenced by Janep 146, which is an order that prohibits members of the armed forces from discussing UFO incidents or sightings on penalty of 10 years in jail, $10,000 fine, and forfeiture of all pay and or pension. You have to understand that this is the biggest secret in the world. 
Now you say, okay, John, you told me a lot of stories and interesting anecdotes, but what is your best evidence that what you say is true? Well, here's a few things. Let's start out with what a staff physicist who works at S4. I'm going to show you these maps a little bit later. Well, maybe I'll show them to you now. This first map is a map of the uh, test site, Nevada test site. It goes all around there. That's the MOA, MOA, the military operating area. This area right in here is a restricted area. You can't fly over it, nor can you go on the ground. This area right here, a little uh, kind of a uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five-sided figure there, is uh, the Tonopah test range, and that's where they fly the stealth fighter. Uh, the 117A, uh, if you want to drive up there, you drive uh, up uh, the road toward Reno, follow it up there like that, get to Tonopah. When you get to Tonopah, turn right, follow the road, all to here until you see, uh, you'll see a rocket ship. And it says, um, I think Tonopah Test Range or something, and you take that road all the way down to the fence right here, and then you turn right at the fence, and you can go along this fence here and take pictures all day long. We have some beautiful ones of the stealth fighter that we're taking right along there. They also keep our MiGs up there. The United States Air Force has uh, one of or more of every MiG that uh, is uh, produced uh, by the Russians, except the uh, MiG-25. That's where they kept. This area down here is used by the Department of Energy to uh, test atomic uh, weapons, underground tests. This area around here like this is used for red flag exercises. That's the military area, uh, aerial training that the Air Force uses for the, um, uh, the, it's the Air Force version of uh, Top Gun. And this area right in the middle here is called Area 51. It's also called Dreamland. It's also called the Ranch, it's called a number of names. Anyway, this is Area 51. There's a 35,000 foot strip right here. There's a number of hangars there. And this is where um, a lot, most of our top secret projects go on. Uh, the U-2 was uh, assembled there. Actually, the U-2 was built in Bakersfield, but assembled up here. Uh, the SR-71 was built in Burbank and assembled up there. <coughs> Aurora is tested here. Aurora is the follow-on for the SR-71. It's a Mach uh, 6 to 7 airplane, 250,000 feet, three-man crew. It operates from there, has been operational for about the past two years. But the place that we're interested in is right here. Right to the south here, 10 miles south, it's called S-4. And that's where the government keeps the flying saucers. And you get there by bus. Incidentally, this whole area, you get there by airplane in the morning when you go to work. You drive up to Hughes here, and you go through a security check, and you get into a little uh, 737, white with a red stripe. If you're driving out of town, you can see them parked off to the left there. And they take you in by air. That's how they control the security up there. And when you get out of there, there's very few people who work down here, but down in S4 where they keep the saucers is um, uh, they take you the bus down there, and the bus has uh, blacked out windows, so you can't see where you're going. So let me show you what this physicist had to say, and the date was May 15th. So it wasn't too long ago. He said this on the 5 o'clock news uh, on Channel 8. secret of spots on the planet. It's located on the northeast edge of the Nevada test site and is said to be where weapon systems have been tested over the years. According to some UFO researchers, it's also where the government is test flying alien spacecraft. It sounds pretty far out, but some Las Vegas residents report having seen these flying saucers. A local scientist who says he worked at Groom Lake and saw the saucers joins us in tonight's interview. He has asked that his identity be shielded. Sir, how do we know you are who you say you are and that you actually have knowledge about what's going on at Groom Lake? Well, I guess there's no way you could really know. Uh, uh, there's really no way I can prove it without revealing my identity and getting myself into more trouble than I have already. Exactly what's going on up there? Well, there's several, uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying discs uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. 
and uh, they're basically being dismantled. Uh, some are, well, in various stages of, of completion, built from other parts, and they're being test flown and uh, uh, basically just analyzed. You say there's nine saucers. How, how are those tests going? Uh, as far as what? As far as whether they're successful and, and, and that sort of thing. Oh, well, some of them uh, are 100 percent intact and operate perfectly. Uh, the other ones are being taken apart. Uh, I was involved mainly in, in propulsion and the power source. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically, uh, as far as I can remember, there are about half of them do operate. And the other half are, are just been torn down, uh, basically to analyze the components to them. Where, where did we get these saucers? Uh, how did they come into the hands of the government? I haven't the slightest idea, and uh, you have to understand the information is very compartmentalized, and uh, I was only allowed information that pertained particularly to what I was involved in. But I mean, couldn't, couldn't our government have made them as opposed to getting them from some alien beings? Totally impossible. Uh, the propulsion system is an, uh, a gravity propulsion system. The power source is an antimatter reactor. Uh, this technology does not exist at all. In fact, one of the reasons that I'm going forward with this information, it's uh, not only a crime against the American people, it's a crime against the scientific community, which I've been part of for some time, for actively trying to duplicate these systems, yet they are in existence now and basically in the hands of the government. What would happen to you if the government learned that you were giving us this information? Anything could happen. I don't know. It's, uh, I haven't the slightest idea. Well, you said uh, you were referred to getting into trouble. Have you had some repercussions already? Yeah, I've been threatened with uh, uh, being charged with espionage. Uh, I've had my life threatened by them, my wife's life threatened by them, and uh, uh, I, I mean, I don't know where else you can go from there. Will the government ever tell us about the testing, and, and do the Soviets know about this? The Soviets were involved at some specific point. Uh, they were kicked out of the program rather abruptly uh, in the middle. I don't know why that, why that was or what happened. Uh, they're not very happy about it. And uh, as far as them revealing it, I'm sure they have every intention of claiming that all the technology was developed here, and it was absolutely not. If the Soviets were kicked out of, of this testing program, why wouldn't they tell us about this? I have no idea. They weren't allowed all the information. Apparently they had some and we were basically trading with them. Uh, as far as whether they have disks or not, I don't know. Uh, I don't even know if they had knowledge that we actually had any there. But uh, they were involved to some extent and I, I don't know how much. What about aliens? Any of those up there at Groom Lake? Uh, I really want to steer away from that right now. Uh, is the Star Wars program in any way related to what's going on up there? I know some people believe that maybe we're building Star Wars for something other than, than the Soviets. This directly taps out of the Star Wars budget, um, which is very hard to follow because it requires huge amounts of money. Uh, it also uh, it, it taps out of a lot of other uh, places, too, that, that would be very hard to track down. But yes, yeah, Star Wars is directly related to it. Uh, the United States Navy is the part of the government that really maintains control over this. Well, we want to thank you for joining us. It's pretty interesting stuff you've got to say. Thank you. I think we all owe Dennis a hand for coming forward. That was pretty interesting information. A couple of weeks ago, we found out uh, one of the nights that the government was going to fly uh, one of the, uh, the saucers, so we were told when and where to stand, and we went out there, and uh, we got some on videotape, it's just a blob, but I just want to show you this quick videotape we made after uh, with the thing went down, and we're standing around. I'm Lear, and today is March 22nd, 1989. We're standing just about uh, eight miles due east of Groom Lake, Nevada, the super government uh, secret test site. And just a few minutes ago, we saw one of the government uh, uh, extraterrestrial UFOs fly over there. Uh, we all watched it for about uh, seven or eight minutes. 
right here I have my Celestron scope. Uh, it's eight uh, inches, and I had uh, uh, had it focused in for about 15 seconds and saw for myself that in fact it was a disc. And we're going to uh, uh, stay here for another couple hours here to see if we can show you folks uh, an actual uh, extraterrestrial flying saucer being uh, flown by the government. So if you just stand by and. Uh, We'll be looking over that mountain, which is where they are. They also come over here, which is over at Bald Mountain. There's some lights over there, which you can't see, but there are a number of trucks. We don't know whether they're looking down here or <clears throat> what they're doing up there, but we managed to get in here. Uh, we're standing on public land. It's uh, completely legal where we are. And if you'd like to uh, come here later in the show, we'll tell you exactly how to get here. Incidentally, the third night we went up, uh, Dennis was with us, and uh, the next morning got fired. Uh, next morning, he's had three th threats to his life since then, and he's not doing too well, but I will report to you that he is still alive. Uh, just quickly, for those of you that want to go see a flying saucer, you uh, take Highway 15 north out of here to Salt Lake City, and there's a cutoff, uh, Highway 93, that goes to, I think the sign says Caliente. Uh, follow the uh, signs up towards Caliente until you get to a place called Ash Springs. At Ash Springs, there's a cutoff, and you take the left one, and the cutoff says either Tonopah or Warm Springs. And you follow that road up through the mountains here, and you'll go up through a pass and come back down through the mountains. Now, just as you get out of the pass, right, right there, not any further, you'll see a long dirt road. It's about eight miles long. Get on that dirt road, that's the northeast entrance to Groom Lake. Now, you can't obviously go all the way to Groom Lake because it's a classified facility. But what you do is get on that road, and let me explain a little bit. This map up here, and they'll be available to you later if you want to look in real closely, Groom Lake is printed right on there by the BLM. Uh, these are restricted areas, these uh, yellow, uh, or these red areas here. And this area marked in black right here was part of what was known in 19... Uh, 86 is the famous Air Force Groom land grab. And what they did was they grabbed some BLM land here because they didn't want people standing on top of that mountain and watching the saucer fly in there or whatever they had flying in there. So when you go down this road, this from the road to the black line is 5.2 miles. Now, yesterday, uh, some people drove out there and got all the way to the gate. The gate's up here, it's 15 miles from the entrance. And as long as you do that in daytime, they probably won't bother you. But uh, it'd be pre pretty risky to try it at night. They might, uh, no telling what they might doing, uh, be doing. Um, they are, there are soldiers out there. They have no name, rank, or serial number. They drive blazers and uh, camouflage uniforms, as I say, with no rank or serial number. Uh, if you're going at night, be sure you stop there because then you're not getting into the area. But if you go any farther than that, you do so at your own risk. Just some other of the uh, evidence. And we'll wrap this up. Uh, Cash Landrum case, Gulf Breeze, Lonnie Samora, Thomas Mantell, the 1975 SAC base overflights, the JAL incident in Alaska, the Bentwaters incident, the Walton incident, the Pascagoula incident, the Kirtland Air Force Base incident, on and on and on. The Kentucky uh, abduction case, the Wake Island incident, the Harmon Field incident, the South Caicos incident, the Hudson Valley sightings, the Whitfield, Virginia sightings. If you gave five minutes on each of these, I'm sure you'd begin to understand what I'm talking about. Uh, if you're interested in uh, more reading, I would have you read uh, Introductory Space Science, Volume 2, Chapter 13, uh, the Stringfield Papers, the Senator Richard Russell sighting in Russia, 1955, the W.B. Smith Memo, the Dr. Robert Sarbacher Letter, Grudge Report, Number 13. Then I'd have you read the following books, Communion, Missing Time, Intruders, Light Years, Clear Intent, Sky Crash, the Roswell Incident, Crash at Aztec, An Alien Harvest by Linda Howe just came out and will be available, uh, uh, it's available now. Above by Top Secret by Timothy Good. And when you've digested that information, two and a half years of investigation of UFOs, was the Kennedy assassination. How many people here in this room think Oswald ki killed Kennedy? Up with your hand. Several. Okay. Now, would you like to know who did?
Nearly 25 years ago, the people of the United States and the world were shattered by the impact of an assassin's bullets upon the helpless, unsuspecting young president of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. The horrendous wound inflicted by those bullets has penetrated deeply into the body and soul of America, destroying the very lives of thousands and the heart and trust and political will of literally millions. And the years that have passed since this tragic event removed from the world stage perhaps one of the most promising human agents of peace and progressive political development, we have been fed one officially sanctioned lie after another, beginning with a blue ribbon cover-up commission to a castrated Senate Select Committee sh seeking to shed light upon an event deliberately enshrouded in deception, concealment, and outright falsehood. Twenty-five years is long enough. It is time the truth was finally told in the earnest hope that it will truly set us free of the murderers who pose as our protectors. What we're observing here is the motorcade in Dallas on November 22, 1963. As the presidential car passes behind the freeway sign, President Kennedy is struck in the throat by a bullet that was fired from the grassy knoll. As he's grasping his throat, John Connolly is turning around to his right. He, at that point, is struck. You notice the driver, or excuse me, the passenger of the car turning back to see what has happened to the president. As he turns back to the front, the driver of the car turns with his left arm over his right shoulder with a pistol and fires. You see the 45 automatic, 45 caliber nickel-plated automatic weapon in his left hand, he's firing over his right shoulder. You see it in relief, you see his head pointing backwards towards the president. In this enhanced close-up, you see the impact of the bullet upon the president. The force of the shot drives him violently backward against the back of the seat. You see Mrs. Kennedy react in horror. The ugly, gaping wound, which is evident here, according to many observers at the scene, was actually created on the print. This was not the actual nature of the wound. But you notice that Mrs. Kennedy wasted no time in trying to exit the vehicle because she clearly was able to determine exactly where that shot had originated. And it was her personal bodyguard, Clint Hill, another Secret Service agent, who attempted to keep her in. What the arrow is indicating here is what appears to be the outline of a man, a hat, and his rifle. The arrow is pointing to the rifle barrel of the man in the bushes who possibly was the rifleman on the grassy knoll who fired that shot. Another view taken by another photographer. Again, you see Mrs. Kennedy trying to exit the vehicle from behind, being pushed back in by her bodyguard. Number of witnesses on the scene rushing towards the vehicle. this section. The man standing on the far right of the wall there is Abraham Zapruder, the photographer who took the original photos. The arrow here is indicating what was very likely uh, the rifleman on the grassy knoll, the man who fired the shot which penetrated Kennedy's throat from the front, not from behind as the Warren Commission would have you believe. Very interesting note also that the motorcycle policemen were told to remain behind the car at all times. Here you see photographer, again, you see Mrs. Kennedy trying to exit the vehicle from behind, being pushed back in by her bodyguard. Number of witnesses on the scene rushing towards the vehicle. In this section, the man standing on the far right of the wall there is Abraham Zapruder, the photographer who took the original photos. The arrow here is indicating what was very likely uh, the rifleman on the grassy knoll, the man who fired the shot which penetrated Kennedy's throat from the front, not from behind, as the Warren Commission would have you believe. Very interesting note also that the motorcycle policemen were told to remain behind the car at all times. Here you see the passenger in the front turning back, looking at the president. Instead of jumping back to assist him, he turns forward. The driver's now rotating. The weapon comes into view, and he fires. You'll see this repeatedly in these sequences. Kennedy's been shot in the throat. He's leaning to his left. The driver now begins to rotate. His left arm comes over his right shoulder, and he fires now. Again, you see the driver rotate. You see the weapon come into view. He's rotating again. The weapon is in view. He fires. 
can clearly see his head turning and the, his arm and the weapon extending into view over his right shoulder. Many of the witnesses indicated that the car slowed almost to a virtual halt. Government lie. After all, they lied to you about the Pentagon Papers. They lied to you about Watergate. They lied to you about Iran Gate. But surely they wouldn't lie about flying saucers. Surely they would have told you if they had recovered an extraterrestrial vehicle. Surely they wouldn't be giving you 1,001 reasons why flying saucers aren't real if they were. And the government aid is aided and abetted by Carl Sagan, James Oberg of NASA, Bob Schaefer, Phil Class of Aviation Week and Space Technology. Remember these names well, for they are known as the keepers of the hoax. What hoax? The hoax that flying saucers do not exist, that ETs are not among us, that Roswell did not happen, or as